freedom in behavior makes use of positive reinforcers and negative reinforcers. But the positive reinforcers cause belief in free will, they hinder the ability to use scientific methods, which you happen to use to modify your behavior and link emotions to freedom in behavior. Negative reinforcers cause escape and avoidance, they end up with a struggle for freedom, deny a belief in free will, and lead you to overanalyze. Eventually, both of these sections come together to eventually deny the idea of freedom in everyday life. Freedom in behavior translated into Spanish for ESOL students. La libertad en el comportamiento hace uso de resultados positivos y resultados negativos. Resultados positivos encargados de hacer cumplir. Que causan la creencia en el libre albedrío. Obstaculiza la capacidad de utilizar los métodos de la ciencia. Que se utiliza para modificar su comportamiento. Emociones tienen en Laces a la libertad en el comportamiento. Mientras que la libertad en el comportamiento hace uso de la reencargados. Que causan escape y evasión. Termina con una lucha por la libertad. Niega la creencia en el libre albedrío. Te conduce a la sobreanalizar. Finalmente, niega la idea de la libertad en cada día de vida. Focus question. Should behaviorism shape educational practices? Event. Assess B.F. Skinner's opinion of behaviorism on educational practices. Key concepts. Positive reinforcers and negative reinforcers are both dangerous. Students need to learn to balance both. Principles. Positive reinforcers cause the belief of free will, which will stop the use of the scientific method. Students will be too preoccupied with the unrealistic part of freedom. A record that supports this is, what the layman calls a reward is a positive reinforcer of which have been exhaustively studied in the experimental analysis of operant behavior. And the last principle is, if they have negative reinforcers, such as being too realistic, causes escape and avoidance, which hinders thinking outside the box. A record that supports this is, negative reinforcers are called aversive in the sense that they are the things organisms turn away from. Escape and avoidance play a much more important role in the struggle for freedom. Theory. Freedom and behavior makes use of positive reinforcers or negative reinforcers, both which can end poorly. Therefore, behaviorism should be a crucial factor in shaping classroom criteria because it standardizes learning and make to make it the most useful for all students. Knowledge claims. Scientific reasoning is lost, and therefore children cannot understand the correct educational way of going about solving puzzles and such. Value claims. Children need a full circle of freedom and cynicism. As a child, you have freedom, but it's good to instill certain properties to encourage them to explore more around them, not frighten them. I'm Shay. I'm Megan. And today we'll be addressing the issue of should behaviorism affect educational practices? B.F. Skinner in the position of yes and Carl Rogers in the position of no. I'm, I'm impressed with the translation. I mean, I thought it was well done. My Spanish is high school Spanish, but it's... So is mine. Yeah, so I mean, I can remember Scientifico, this movie, you know, but... Um, 
So I'm impressed with that, your sense of humor about it, and, but the, the best part for me, you were enthusiastic. It sounded like, okay, I'm trying to have some fun, but I also spent some time trying to do my work. How did you translate? Oh, well, um, I have a friend who is Mexican. Oh, okay. And, um, I asked her, you know, some, some of the words I did use Google Translator for, some of the words that I knew myself. Oh, okay. And some of the words I asked her, which are like some of the phrases, okay. I asked her to translate for me. And your experience in Spanish is high school? Have you taken um, any here? I haven't taken any here, but Spanish, or the school that I went to, we started learning Spanish What's first grade. Problems? I always think you're from Florida, right? First grade was when we, well, not even first grade, um, kindergarten, we started, we started learning Spanish. We started learning the little like, phrases. So I've had Spanish since I was about, I'd say, five years old. Would you say you were fluent? Have you ever been to Mexico and talked I've been to Mexico, okay. yes. And it helps that I had a, my friend who is Mexican, because she was in the Bahamas for a while, and then she moved back to Mexico. So now, when I talk here, I still talk in Spanish. Okay. Talk a little bit about how you see positive and negative reinforcers usable in school and what your attitude towards that is. In other words, how do teachers use positive and negative, and you as a philosopher, how do you feel about those tools? Well, I feel that, you know, in my opinion, I think it's good to use positive reinforcers on the children. It's good to be like, you know, hey, let's, you know, you can do what you want, you can be what you want. I don't really, I, I'm kind of on the fence about it, about B.F. Skinner's argument. I'm, what I really am worried about though, and I've been thinking about it a lot, that as a teacher I'm worried that if I'm too easygoing, that the students will take advantage of that and that they won't get the full experience sure. that they do, you know, from someone who might be a little bit more practical. Okay. But I'm also like, I don't want them to, you know, analyze everything, because here, you see, negative reinforcers leads you to overanalyze everything. And I don't want them to be like, oh, you have to have math or science. There's no imagination in it. Okay. Could you give an example of a negative reinforcer? Well, say, back in um, my senior year of high school, I, for community service hours, I would go down to the elementary school and I'd be an assistant teacher. What happened was, in one of our classes, they had to draw a man, and he had to have a red circle for his head, a blue um, rectangle for his body, and a girl would like go to like draw a green circle for his head, and the teacher would be like, "No, it has to be red. If it's not red, then it's not correct." And I feel that that's kind of like hindering their artistic abilities and their, you know, their freedom. I think the problem um, with the Skinner is the fact that he's very cut and dry, and he sees it one way. And the problem with educating is, is that there's multiple people in a classroom, and all of their and just somehow be incorporated to make them pay attention and understand the material. And I mean, some people thrive under positive reinforcers, some people thrive under negative reinforcers, but you have to find um, a balance for the entire classroom that you're teaching. I mean, his advocacy is for, it's much easier to control people by giving them benefits by positive. The thing he steers away from is punishment. says, because it's unpredictable. If you hit a kid, you have no idea what that kid is going to do in response. The problem with that, though, is, I mean, reinforcement is a good thing, and it's a good thing for even younger kids, but you don't want to orient a class either on a reward basis. They shouldn't be learning because in the object of getting a reward. They should, they should be learning, learning because they want to. They want to, that they're actually interested in the subject. Right. And, the, and his sense of, oh, internal rewards is nonsense. Just control their environment and you get pigeons to dance. And that would be his argument. I really don't care about the internal experience of a pigeon. All I want to see is what he does. And he's saying, as a scientist, as a psychologist, I'm trying to control things. I'm trying to come up with laws, just like gravity, just like electricity, etc. I feel like you can get any child excited in what they're doing. You just have to find the way that, you know, you have to find what they enjoy out of the subject. Yeah, and he would say that, well, then you know, have learn to manipulate and fun. So his argument always becomes, don't tell me about inner experience. Let me tell you about what I observe, and I really don't care about the inner experiences. So Skinner uh, really hit big in the 60s and 70s. I think he died in 
psychologist was Freud for looking at dreams and inner experience and Skinner said, that's nonsense, who cares about that? That's not science, that's mumbo jumbo. And so then he, they became the positivists, became the behaviorists. And then our buddy Carl Rogers said, oh, I got another idea, let's talk about inner experience and we'll get to that. 